Welcome back and just wow. <laughs> I had the great privilege of speaking with Guru Sethupathy and hearing his story from his childhood through his academic career on into business and where he is now with fairnow.ai. And Fairnow is very appropriately named given what you'll hear in this discussion. I will just get out of the way and let it happen because it was beautiful and inspiring for me to learn about Guru's life and his inspirations and get his thoughts on where we are now and where we're heading. So hope you enjoy. Hi, welcome back. I'm here with Guru Sethapathy. Guru, how are you, sir? Hey, good afternoon. Good to see you, Al. Hey, great to see you. It, it's been a while since we've been together in person, but I've been following what you've been doing for years, and I just love the way you show up and the narrative that you had. I remember when you introduced the half-life of skills to me and had such a beautiful narrative around that, but you have created the people analytics capability at Capital One, or at least took it to the next level. Uh, you have an ethical stance uh, around the human experience at work. You have an economics background. So if you would, please introduce yourself and uh, then we'll get into the discussion. Yeah, yeah. Happy to. Happy to. And again, good to see you. Um, I know COVID kept us apart for a little bit, and uh, but gl glad to re-engage with you and all the work you're doing as well. So uh, looking forward to this conversation. Um, but yeah, very recently, I, um, I just stepped away from Capital One, um, was an executive at Capital One, built uh, the people analytics function there, um, and then continued to work on some new innovative ideas and technologies that maybe we'll cover in this conversation. Um, and then have just stepped down now to um, co-found a startup in the technology space, specifically in the space of AI, responsible AI. And I know we'll get into that space uh, and that topic in a lot more detail, but that's what I'm doing now full time and uh, excited to, to, to do that. Now, I, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated because we have known each other for years and we actually did a podcast years ago, uh, but we have a new format now. And the format, it consists of this, is going into your history a bit, because I want to understand your journey into economics and go from economics to, hey, I want to get into understanding people's behaviors, likes, dislikes, you know, organizationally, how does that affect how things are done culturally and otherwise? So if you would take us back, you know, where did it start? You know, where did you grow up? You know, what uh, inspired you when you were younger? Yeah. Oh, that's uh, taken me way back. But I think, I think one of the things you'll see that's a theme is kind of the intersection of humans and technology, right? And that interface and I've always been captivated by that interface, but um, going way back and especially this topic of fairness, um, I think really hits on that. And, and we'll talk about that in a second and how I came to that view over time, Al. Um, going back, I, look, I grew, I was born in India, but I grew up in, in Western New York in a small town in uh, uh, between Rochester and Buffalo. If you've ever been to Niagara Falls, you probably drove by my hometown. Uh, that's, that, that's our claim to fame. But um, you know, I, I had a tough childhood. Um, I'm not going to lie or, or sugarcoat that. I think that's shaped me in, in a lot of ways. Um, lost my mom at a very young age in a car accident. So very kind of uh, traumatically. Um, and, and the ensuing years after that were very, very, very difficult and challenging. And I think why that's important is because it, I think right off the bat, uh, it, you know, as a kid, I thought about this concept of fairness, right? It, it all felt very deeply unfair. And um, I have two kids of my own now. And it's, it's funny, like when they argue or fight, the, the, the primary thing they're fighting about is some sense of unfairness. And I say that to say, I think all of us as humans have this deep seated feeling and notion about what is fair and what is unfair. If we do something to our best of our ability, whether it's a sports match, whether it's work, whatever that is, and we feel like we lost fair and square, we're okay with that. I think we all can go to bed at night being okay with that. But it's when we felt the rules weren't fair. And you hear that now, even with Silicon Valley Bank collapsing, right? And people are starting to talk about, hey, is that fair? Are the rules fair? Is it rigged? Is it not rigged, right? This comes up all the time, this idea of rigged fairness. And it's because I think as humans from the day we're born, and that's why I brought up my young, very young daughters, from the day we're born, we have this sense of like fairness, 
or unfairness in the world. And we feel very aggrieved if unfairness has happened, right? And I think um, that's the sense I, I, I had as a kid, right? I'm like, hey, all this stuff happened to me. I'm just a kid. Why did this have to happen? Now, of course, with time, you realize, hey, all sorts of things happen to everyone. And like, that's life. And, you know, you, you, you got to learn how to, how to deal with, with anything that comes your way. But that was kind of my initial insight as to like, hey, things aren't fair and this feels awful, right? And so I have great empathy for that, for people who feel that. And what age, if I might ask, did that occur with your mom? Yeah, my mom passed away when I was eight. When I was okay. Eight. And, so um, obviously a very formidable stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was, you know, very close to her. And I think, it, it, especially also when it happens in an instant, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's quite traumatic. You know, you don't, it, it just changes your whole life in an instant and you don't know how or why or what to do about it. Um, and then the ensuing decade was, was quite challenging for me, my family, and, and all of that entailed. And it was, it was a very challenging time. Um, but the next step in my journey, I would say, is I, I worked on a research project, you know, that um, uh, crossed high school and college. And it was a pretty neat project, actually, that identified whether or not the way our political system, like the number of seats each state gets in Congress, is fair. And it was fascinating because that was the first time now, because in the first part of this conversation, I talked about the human element of fairness. Like we all feel fairness and unfairness. But in this project, it was interesting because we got, we got to basically quantify fairness, which is something I never thought you could do, right? I thought it was a feeling, right? And now we were able to use algorithms and techniques to quantify fairness to say, hey, is California having 55 seats? Is that fair versus Wyoming getting two seats? Is that you know, how is that fair and, and able to actually use math and statistics to quantify that. And so this is what I mean by the intersection of technology analytics and human nature. Like this topic of fairness sits right at the center of it. You know, you need math to basically be able to identify and quantify fairness. But at the end of the day, fairness is a feeling, Al. And people, and you can use all the math in the world, but people have to feel fairness. They have to sense fairness. They have to perceive fairness. So it's a really interesting kind of intersection. And that intersection is something I've just loved my whole life. And that's why I got into economics. If you think about economics, it's a social science, but it's really this intersection of math and quant with human nature, humans, and how we, we work, how we do things, how we make decisions, and how that all aggregates up into an economy that hopefully works really well. Um, but that's what I love about economics. It's, a, it's almost this combination of human psychology and math to answer really interesting questions. Well, you know, thank you for sharing. And I, I am hesitant to share this, but I will just put it out. As <laughs> you know, <laughs> economics is often referred to as the dismal science <laughs> because it is infinitely frustrating because there's no answer and you're high-fiving down the hallways. It, it's just you're understanding dynamics and hopefully you can find a way to move forward that's better than where you you, you came from so you embarked on a, both a beautiful journey it sounds like but also one that has this frustration particularly when you talk about fairness can you, to your point can undercover yeah. what is unfair and that relates to today around diversity equity and inclusion and and you know a bunch of other facets around burnout well-being and and right. workload management all these things so you know, with that, you know, as a staging, now you're, you know, in college, you're doing the, this project. I mean, where did you go from there? This inspired, you know, what next step? Well, I think part of my uh, journey has been one of, um, uh, you know, just curiosity. I, I think I'm a deeply curious person. And so even in the time I was in college, I think um, I felt like I could do a lot of things, right? Like from the humanities interested me, engineering interested me, STEM in, uh, interested me. And so there's a lot of different ways I could go about it. I, uh, at some level thought about doing a double major, one in technical field, one in the humanities. Again, it's this interest in like the math side of things and the human side of things. And I was always, I've always been trying to like, you know, uh, weigh both sides and experience both sides. Um, and so again, I, I, you know, I did, I did do a startup during my time in college. It, it was it's just something that's kind of always been on my sense of excitement and, you know, wanting to create things. And that's the other thing that's been part of my journey is wanting to create things, right? Like what, what doesn't exist in the world that like, I particularly could be well-suited to like help create, help build and, and help make for the world. Right. And, uh, I think there's nothing more fundamentally, um, moving, 
right? Whether you're creating a family or whether you're creating a technology, like that's so powerful and empowering to feel like, hey, you made something that the world cares about, right? And so I um, had the opportunity to experience a startup and, and um, had a great experience doing that. And then, you know, my career meandered for a little bit, but got into economics after uh, soon after, right? Not unsurprisingly, as we just chatted about and got my PhD and, um, and, and loved the field. I still consider myself as an economist at heart, uh, again, because it bridges the psychology of human nature versus the, the mathematical analytical side. And you get to like deep insights around where is the world going? What drives kind of human productivity and human um, achievement? And how does that lead up into the economic forces that drive uh, our economy today? And um, in particular, during my time in economics, I studied, uh, again, how uh, technology, artificial intelligence, and globalization, how these factors are shaping the world of work. How's it going to change? And, 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 and now that's how you, you and I chatted about this back, must have been 2018 or so. But that's when I said I t would t talk to you about, hey, the half-life of skills, right? We talked about this and I would say, hey, the half-life of skills is falling. Like our parents and grandparents, you know, they would learn certain skills and they could expect those skills to last a lifetime. And now, you know, we have to keep uh, reinventing ourselves. You know, you learn something and five years from now, it could be obsolete. And so how do you continuously reinvent yourself? How do you stay dynamic as an individual? Um, I, I actually think each of us, you know, we talk about entrepreneurship in the context of starting companies, but you, I think people need to think about entrepreneurship in, this, in, the, in the standpoint of reinventing themselves. Mm -hmm. How are you a personal entrepreneur of your personal product that you're offering to the world? That has to continuously evolve and change. Otherwise, your stock price goes to zero, so to speak, right? And so I think there's an analogy there that's worth chatting about too. Oh gosh, yes! You you, you gave me a chill. <laughs> I, I just like okay, I'm gonna carve that little piece out and I'm gonna give it to my kids, you know. <laughs> but no, it's an invaluable perspective, and I, for what it's worth, I believe you're you're spot on because number one, I believe it to be true, but number two, I don't see the world evolving that way across the board. Now, there are some more progressive organizations that you know see that and they're investing in training and others, but others are maybe behind the curve on this front of those companies that are maybe behind the curve. What, what do you say? What, what's the risk of not investing in your people so they can learn and remain cutting edge? Yeah. I think there's two uh, concerns. One is retention of talent, right? More and more, the number one reason that people stay at companies is that they have room to grow mm -hmm. from a career standpoint, from a skill standpoint, that's what people seek. That's even higher than job security, mm. right? People want to grow. There's a sense of purpose that people have, these next generations, and they want to grow. They want to learn. They want to get better, and they want to feel like they have opportunities to do that. Um, and so you're going to lose talent, that great talent, if, if, if that's not the culture that you have. The second thing, in a world where there's so much change, constant change, if tools, technologies, ways of doing things are constantly changing... You have two options. You can upskill your workforce or you can keep swapping out your workforce, right? And laying off people and hiring new people and laying off new people and hiring new people. That is so expensive, Al. That is so <laughs> expensive. So even from here, you know, <laughs> even if you didn't care about your, your employees growing and learning for their self, you should care for, for, your, for yourself as a, as a leader of a company because the world's changing so fast. Technology is changing so fast. Just in the last 10 years, right? We've talked about companies going through incredible transformation of data, right? Moving their data to the cloud, understanding the cloud and the cloud technologies, understanding analytics and how analytics can power uh, the decisions that they make, understanding kind of governance and regulation around this. And now there's, you know, just as they're getting their heads around that journey, AI, right? And AI is about to disrupt and AI is going to do X, Y, Z. And so if you're not constantly kind of learning and like understanding where the technology is coming and where, you know, what's next, I think you're going to be at a competitive disadvantage and, and your workforce is, is, is not going to stay. Yeah. Well, th thank you for voicing that because not only do you compromise, you know, or not only do you have a heightened expense, you know, compromise has been business continuity, social yeah. capital, and all these other facets as well. So yeah, I certainly celebrate what you're sharing there. And but before we go further, because I'm, I'm tempted to pursue this topic, but I, we will come back to the idea of learning agility and the need to stay 
innovative and, and continuously learn. Mm -hmm. But you're here getting your PhD. Did you think of staying in academia? Where did you go once you got that piece of paper? Yeah, no, it was my PhD was a wonderful journey. I mean, it was such a it, it, it's such a challenging experience getting a PhD. It's, it's funny, like after your first two years of coursework, your third year, you're just tossed into the water and you, you got to figure out how to swim, which is like, how do you create research? How do you create new ideas? And it's a phenomenal intellectual challenge. I enjoyed it very much. Um, and I, I did go into academia for a bit. I, I was an assistant professor at Hop, Hop, Johns Hopkins on the tenure track there um, and continue to do my research in this area that I mentioned around, you know, how is um, you know, labor markets and, and workforce and how, how is it all being affected by technology? Um, but I, I think a couple of things from a personality standpoint, I, I, I love the intellectual side of things, but I also like doing right. I, you know, you learn about yourself over your life and I like creating, I like building and you don't get to do that in academia. And, um, also the pace of things is a bit slower that I like to move fast. And so as I learned about myself, I said, Hey, this is probably not where I want to spend the next 30 years of my life. And, uh, um, and so I left and, and, and got back into the private sector and spent some time both at McKinsey, but then, uh, you know, at Capital One really, again, pursuing my interests around the intersection of analytics, technology, and human capital. And, and that's really become my, my area of passion and had the opportunity to advise companies while I was at McKinsey and had the opportunity to build a world-class uh, people analytics organization at Capital One. And it's been a pleasure. Yeah, yes, you did. Because I remember when you came in and you embody growth mindset. Yeah, and I, I'll just quick sidebar. <laughs> I have for years when my kids have gone to bed when they were young, uh, I we do gratitudes and affirmations. And they talk about gratitude for the sheets on their bed, you know, relationships in their life, food on the table, all those things. And and the affirmations are very intentional. And they started with three C's, kindness, curiosity, and creativity. Hmm. Now I know kindness starts to <laughs> change. <laughs> so hard to see. Uh, and there's compassion, there's celebrate others, there's collaborate, courage, and a variety of others that emerge. But I just want to say that, just call out that you embody exactly what I was hoping, or that I still hope my kids um, yeah, represent day to day in, in their lives. You know, just showing up in a very kind, curious, creative way, being resourceful and, and all those good things. And that has shown through your academic journey as well as your professional journey, which brings me to Capital One, because <laughs> you are like, oh, <laughs> well, what's going on here? And I'm like, I, I just so you know, and I don't know if you recall me saying this is like, I believe this is a creative discipline at heart. Yeah. Like the, the reality that's going to be appropriate for Capital One is going to emerge. It's, you can't take a playbook and say, you know, go step one through 10. You have to understand your internal customer. You have to understand the resources that you have, the constraints that you have and so forth. So with that staging, you know, you took a what I observed as a relatively small capability and built what I observed as a world-class leading edge capability. Can you talk about that journey and you know how you were able to instill confidence and leadership to command those resources and make innovation happen there? Yeah, I think your comment was just so prescient uh, and I appreciated that advice early on, right? Like there's, broad, there's a broad playbook perhaps, but each company and each context is different, right? And you really, you know, this, this is advice I give people today. You have to understand your internal context deeply and understand kind of the business. Um, I think the most successful people analytics functions actually understand the business really well, like really, really well. Um, understand kind of, and by understanding the business really well, you can really understand the talent pain points of the business really, really well. Mm -hmm. And if you can speak that language that your customer understands and you really hit home on that, they're gonna, you're gonna build credibility, right? And so that goes directly to answering your question. You gotta understand the company, the business, and the talent questions that flow from those challenges to be able to speak that language and, and, and build that credibility with your ultimate customers. Um, I, and I think that just takes time, right? That takes time and effort to, to really put in. Uh, put in. If, you, if you go in and say, hey, I'm gonna do ONA and I'm gonna do predictive attrition and I'm gonna do X, Y, Z, how do we know that's the right, those are the right things to focus on? I mean, do you know my business? Do you know, I don't actually have any attrition. So maybe that's not the right thing. Or maybe I, I'm not, maybe ONA is not the right uh, thing to worry about right now because I'm worried about kind of trust issues internally and that might break trust. So, you know, there's, all, you know, so if you just go in like kind of imposing your ideas, I think that's going to be 
uh, less well received than if you go in really, you know, customer back and understanding your, your business, your customers, et cetera. And, you know, um, so it spent like the first, I would almost say this spent the first six months to a year really investing in that. Not that I ever stopped doing that, but really investing in that. And then the other thing is, uh, this is something I, I would talk about often. You got to get your, your product and ser- consulting has to be incredibly infallible, right? Like if, if, if you're an analytics function and you make mistakes with analytics, you're done, right? So you got to get the data right. The data has got to be high quality. You got to get the analytics right. Uh, that's got to be high quality. And you got to get your storytelling right. And that's got to be high quality. So those, all three of those pieces got to come together. So we invested heavily in all of that. And then it's a virtuous cycle, Al. So once you have, you, you know, your customers feel like you understand them, once your product and your consulting are at a high level, then you have incredible credibility. And there's a snowball effect where you get pulled into projects that are just the highest leverage projects for the company. And you can really upskill and upscale your organization, your people analytics function. Yeah, I actually love it. Well, t- tell me a little bit about that last part, uh, because there's a book that you and I discussed, or at least I mentioned it in our last discussion, uh, The Persuaders uh, by Anand uh, Jiri Hadras. I just mumbled his last That's name. I yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was, it's really uh, eye-opening to me because at the heart of what we do in people analytics is evidence-based decision-making, if you will. And we're bringing this confidence inspiring insight at least we hope yet a lot of times Mm -hmm. leaders don't adopt it and actually use it to make change at at least change that we as the analysts see is sometimes very obvious so Mm -hmm. in your experience how did you not only instill confidence among your internal customers but how did you persuade to use that word to go to a more risk of risk, uh, a place where risk was mitigated or the employee experience was going to be improved or, you know, some other benefit was going to be achieved because obviously some leaders just don't have that openness. So tell me about that a little bit, please. Yeah, I think there's a couple elements to this. I think one is, again, building that initial trust and credibility, which we just spent time talking about, right? That, that's mm-hmm. the foundation. And, and this trust and credibility thing, we'll come back to it too later on when we talk about fair now and AI and all that, but trust and credibility is the bedrock for anything that you want to do, right? And so th- it has to be the starting point. So, so that's point number one. Point number two is storytelling. Um, one of the things I learned, which I don't think I knew for a long time in my life, is how much storytelling matters. Mm-hmm. Humans are story. We love stories. Th- that's how we work. You know, we talk about data and AI and analytics and all this stuff is important. But we evolutionarily through our history, we we're, we sat around fireplaces and told stories, right? Mm-hmm. And that's who we are. We stories are used to build trust, stories are used to persuade, stories are used to bond, stories are used to like there there's like four, five, six different purposes for storytelling. And great storytellers are leaders and great leaders are great storytellers. And there's just like a real natural connection between those two. And I think learning now, there's not a one size fits all approach to storytelling, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you can imagine oh, this type of storyteller may not work in this context and, and vice versa. And so, again, I, I talk to leaders and say, hey, understand your context, understand your consumers and craft your storytelling to your customer and great Marketers are good at that, right? Great marketers are really good at understanding the consumer and being able to tell a story that fits each customer, right? And, 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 and hits them where it matters. But storytelling is, is so important. Um, and then the third thing I would say that's really important is identifying influencers. Hmm. And what I mean by that is in the organization, there are a bunch of people in every organization, there will be a bunch of people who see eye to eye with you as it pertains to the importance of whatever it is, but in this context, people analytics and how people analytics can be helpful and where it should be helpful and how it should be helpful and figure out who they are. Hmm. And once you figure out who they are, work on a project with them, work on that project with them and show value. And then they're going to want to do more projects with you, but then they're going to tell others. And if they're influencers, then you're basically amplifying your influence, right? And so now you've outsourced the job of influencing to five other people 
who are excited to share your work and the type of value people analysts can do. And now that spreads through the organization. I, I absolutely love what you're saying. And I'm smiling like this because Michael Arena would certainly agree with you. <laughs> and I also want to highlight, you know, I want to go back to storytelling uh, because we are going to talk about responsible AI and ethics and, and bias and mitigating the risk of, of perpetuating or exacerbating bias. And so when I hear storytelling, I 100% agree with you. Um, I also, it invites the question for me, what stories are we telling and why? And if we're an analyst uh, and you, with your research background, undoubtedly know that we're constantly at risk of confirmation bias. We look for stuff that's going to validate our way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And so my pointed question is, how do we identify the stories that should be told to benefit the employees as well as the organization? That's a great question. That's a great question. I mean, that's where you want to build the right culture on your people analytics team, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the one that we really tried to build is, look, at the end of the day, we care deeply about the humanity of what we do, but we have to have as much scientific rigor as possible, mm -hmm. right? And one of the important aspects of that kind of scientific rigor is not just the type of analytical work we do, but a culture of debate. This is something I care about wherever I go, right? Which is, even if I'm the leader, I want anyone and everyone to speak up if they disagree with me. And it's imperative on me to make you feel as comfortable as possible to speak up. Uh, it's a two-way street there. And we, we both have a responsibility in creating that culture of debate. And I say that is especially to address your point around bias and confirmation bias. We all have biases, mm -hmm. right? And there's no, uh, there's no correlation between intelligence and, and being unbiased. Smart people are as biased as not smart people. And you know, we're, it's, it's human, right? And so the only way to really correct for that is to debate, right? And is to have someone else challenge your bias, right? And you challenge their bias because biases can be, you know, you, we can have different biases, but that allows us to challenge each other's biases, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and so that's really where it starts. And so if we are doing things that are just confirming our own biases and then shipping that out as a product or as a consulting service, that doesn't do anybody any good. We have to debate that internally and make sure we get that right before we, we take it to our clients. Yeah. And, and thank you for sharing that because I have seen too many cases where people on uh, leaders or teams have thought that they were producing a dissertation and they were there to defend it and convince the whole world that they were right. And that's not the case. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. We're inviting conversation. We're inviting debate on what the dynamic is, what the dynamic will emerge and the best way forward to optimize our investments, our time and all these other things. So is that uh, oh, hundred percent. I love that you say. It. Yeah, it can't be. It can't be about showing off how right you are. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Because that you're not going to always be right, and you're going to lose credibility that way. And you're losing the opportunity to bring your partner into the conversation, the problem solving, right? Mm -hmm. And the more someone feels a part of developing the solution, the more likely they're going to adopt it. Versus if you just came and told, if I said, "Hey, I'll do X." Even if you think it's the right answer, you're not that bought into it. Versus if we co-create the answer X, you, you know, you feel like you came up with it and you're going to be more likely to, to do it, to action on it, whatever. And so, and even if X is wrong, then we land on Y, you're more likely because you feel part of it. You, you know, it, it, it's, it's not something that someone, you know, told you. And so it, it both serves a purpose of like overcoming bias and confirmation bias, but it also helps you get buy-in from your partners. So it, it's really the way to go is imagine it as joint problem solving. Hey, we have this data. What do you think about this data, Al? And then, yeah, this is what I think about it. Let's talk about it. Let's debate this. Is this valuable? And, 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 and yeah, absolutely. That's how we want it to operate. You know, yeah, you, you gave me a chill. I got, I got excited because <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I love the way you're framing it. And you also at the end uh, mentioned the data and at the outset you mentioned, you know, confidence and you have to get that right. And we, you know, can't make 
mistakes in in this regard. And yeah, I align with that as well. So my question, again, I'm not going to ask you specifics about your Capital One experience. That wouldn't be appropriate. However, what I do want to ask is regarding data quality and the use of analytics or even the analytics process itself, you know, this is fast moving and has been fast moving for really the past 20 years. In other words, innovations have been coming out like constantly. Mm -hmm. And so there has been this growing anxiety is like, what the heck are we doing? You know, this it's, this it's this black box. And, you know, how do we put boundaries around it so we can instill confidence, not only among us as analysts, but those that we're serving, both executives and the larger workforce. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me what were some of the inspirations in your professional life that you said, hey, we have to do something and thus inspired Fair Now to emerge? Yeah. I mean, one of the observations I had is if you look at um, a space, especially being at Capital One, a space like finance and lending, right? Uh, finance and lending has been around as long as probably humans have been around, right? So like it, it is a core part of <laughs> human uh, organization and civilization. Um, but more recently, uh, there's been more regulation around it, right? So you can talk about the Fair Lending Act. You can talk about all the regulation that came out of, yeah, out of the great uh, financial recession. Um, you know, you can talk about redlining that used to happen and, you, you know, laws against that. Right. So, so much kind of mistakes made and biases and uh, so on and so forth in the past that, you know, regulation has sought to answer. And as a result of that, banks have very sophisticated um, governance mechanisms around this stuff. So uh, Capital One has dozens and dozens of really smart, talented, intelligent people who are singularly focused on governance around their business, around lending, around models used in lending, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and so I saw that and I saw how different that looked in the HR space, mm -hmm. right? And how in the HR space, you're starting to just get an influx. I mean, Al, you've been in this space for decades, so you, you tell me, right? But the the kind of proliferation of HR technologies, HR tools, uh, automated tools in the HR space in the last decade has been crazy. And my concern, and you know, tell me if you disagree, but my concern is along with that has not been an equivalent or commensurate uh, sense of governance around these tools. And do we know which ones are working well? Do we know what they're doing? Is there a bias in them? Is there snake oil in them? Like, what is it that's happening? And um, oftentimes, you know, HR doesn't, may not have, you know, a Capital One. We were lucky to have a big enough people analytics organizations, but most companies don't. So they don't have, a, you know, the, the internal capabilities to, to verify. And they see other companies maybe buying those tools. and like, all right, we got to buy that tool. But that gives me a lot of pause for concern because we're talking about these tools now impacting the associates in that company their livelihoods, their careers, their, you know, hiring paths, all that kind of stuff. And we don't know how well they're working. And now this is going to get even more on steroids with AI coming into place, where it's going to be even more black boxy. So I, I just feel there's a real need here for, for companies to be more well managed. And that was kind of the impetus for, for Fair Now. Well, yeah, thank you for sharing. And I can imagine the look on people's faces who are frequent listeners uh, of my shows is that they're like, yeah, he's big on governance. Yeah, he doesn't think there's enough governance or you know, uh, good enough governance because it's uh, a theme that I constantly come back to. Mm -hmm. It's like because you know, we have to get legal with IT, with HR, with operations. And a lot of times organizations like, oh, I don't need another process. I don't need another set of meetings. I don't need and I'm like, well, you're incurring way too much risk business wise, culture wise, and, you know, on down the line. And the good news is, you know, I think there's a progressive set of leaders who, who get it. And there's huge, in my view, opportunity to really be disciplined about this. And in so doing, elevate trust among the workers, as well as the board and others who are really vested in whether or not you're doing things ethically, responsibly, efficiently, all those things. So is that how you see it? And what would you add to that narrative? 
Yeah, I, I would uh, I would put a different spin on it, right? It's almost mm-hmm. like, you know, you see a fancy car and it doesn't come with brakes. Look, if you want to use that car, you need the brakes. And so I, the, the way I think about this is don't think of the brakes as a cost. Think of that as what's enabling you to drive this awesome car, right? Mm-hmm. And similarly, the way I would think about this is AI is going to be, is that super speedy, sexy car that's going to be coming down your driveway. You want to be able to use it. You have to be well managed because the risks are potentially existential here, right? And, I, and I, I'm not talking about it from a you know, humanity standpoint, but I'm talking about it from a company standpoint, right? Like if, if, if it's not well managed, you can imagine the lawsuits, you can imagine uh, the impacts on your brand. Um, you know, Google just paid out um, a settlement for $118 million. Most companies can't afford that. And, and when I've been talking, having customer conversations on this topic, people tend to agree that, you know, the reason that they've dodged it so far is more luck rather than being well-managed. And you can't count on luck, right? And uh, that, that's not a good way to be well-managed. Um, and so, uh, look, I, I would say if you really, you know, AI is coming. It's here, actually, I would say it's here. And the companies that are able to use this technology are going to be the winners in the next 10 years. Yeah, they you know, are. Like, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. You finish, please. No, I, I'd, I'd almost be saying like, look, if you were using paper and pencil back in the 90s and 2000s and you didn't want to get on computers because it was too weird or too scary or you were afraid of computer viruses, you'd be bankrupt in five years. I mean, you, you had to get on the digital age. You had to move on to computers. And the way you solve computer viruses, you just get a virus, antivirus software, right? Like you figure out ways to be well-managed in order to take advantage of a powerful technology. And that's where we are today. Like analytics and AI is just such a powerful technology. You don't want to like walk away from that. Just invest in being well-managed. Yeah, I absolutely love that. Those are great metaphors and they're going to be sticky for me and I imagine for our listeners as well. So there are uh, current laws that are in place. Obviously, GDPR in Europe, uh, New York, California, Massachusetts have either current or imminent laws. Uh, This is a dynamic situation that we're dealing with on a variety of, of levels. Tell me and our listeners, how you are addressing that multifaceted need to you know, deal with all these laws or imminent laws. Yeah, so you have data uh, laws around data governance that you just addressed, and then you have laws around AI governance that are just starting to come into play. Um, and I expect the next 10 years will be very much like the last decade in terms of what a data governance was for the last decade being AI governance you know, in the next decade. Um, so New York City, um, came out with, I think, the first law in this country that's going into effect in about a month that is an anti-bias law for companies who use AI tools in hiring. Um, and this is a big deal, really big deal. First law of its kind um, and, again, going into effect. And so if there are any companies out there that uh, this will affect, they should think about how they want to address it. Like if they use these tools in hiring, they will need to be compliant and show an audit of that tool to make sure that tool is not biased. And this is not a one thing, one time thing. I, you know, I, I, I'd be, I would be happily place a bet with anyone that there will be many more laws like this in the next couple of years, right? Uh, the EU is considering a very broad act covering not just hiring, but a variety of fields across kind of where AI use cases could manifest. Um, hiring is considered and hiring and other HR use cases are considered in the high risk category which is very serious. It's um, There's one category higher that's more around national security and stuff, but then the very next category is high risk, which is, includes a lot of HR activities. Um, New Jersey and California and other states in the US are considering laws. I, I still expect Europe to kind of, uh, which generally happens to set the standard when it comes to regulations, and then states and locations in the US will, will follow. On this topic, I expect the federal government to get involved at some point because it is such a uh, it's, it's captured people's imagination. I think chat GPT in some ways has accelerated it, right? With, mm-hmm. with people seeing AI and both being excited by its potential, but like also interacting with it and being like, oh my gosh, like what is this thing going to do? What, what could it do wrong? Well, you know, and, and how, how, who's looking at, who's looking after this? Who, who's making sure it doesn't like screw us over, right? And so 
Um, you know, I, I don't think we're going to get the laws right the first time. Um, I think we're in the top of the first inning. Uh, I think there's a long way to go. But for, for companies not to be thinking about this and getting the help to think about this, uh, I think they're going to be at a disadvantage. And you alluded to it earlier. Uh, there is uh, AI is a massively powerful tool and the value can be realized in efficiencies and well-being and you know on down the line. So many leaders thus are hey, jumping at it. They're like, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to go after the value proposition. Others are saying the risk is way too high. You know, I, I don't want to get in that speedy car because the brakes aren't there yet. What would you say? Is this a point where, hey, I'm, wait and see? Or is this a point to, yeah. you know, take advantage of, you know, the value propositions that, you know, again, are very beneficial? I mean, what are your thoughts there? Yeah. Um, look, I think it depends on on the use case, right? And if, the, mm -hmm. if, if there's a lot of value that you think you can get from this, then it's worth it. Right. But then you just have to figure out, hey, how do I stay well managed? And that's where and we'll talk about fair now in a second, but that's where we can help. Right. That's where when you have yeah. technologies like ours to help you stay well managed that allow you to then take the benefits of the AI. Why not? Right. Yeah. Um, so I think that's kind of would be my, my first plus answer. Um, second of all, I think it also just depends on the, the culture of your organization. Right. And where you are right now, our economy and the business world is going through a bit of a retrenchment right? Where organizations and functions within companies are expected to be a little bit more efficient, uh, to maybe cut costs. And, and guess what? Those, there's a lot of economic uh, research on this that shows it's during those times, actually, Al, that companies invest in technology. Hmm. Because that's when you have to like, be a little bit more efficient. And what does technology allow you to do? It allows you to be more efficient, right? And so I actually expect companies to really invest this next couple of years. It's, it's, be, not, it's because of the fact that uh, the economy is kind of slowing down and they're expected to cut costs, that they're actually going to invest in, in, uh, in technology. And so I actually think AI investment is going to go up in the next couple of years across the board to make them more efficient. And HR is one of those places. HR is um, expected to cut costs. Hiring in, is the biggest kind of cost center in HR, right? So if you're the head of HR and you have a, uh, a remit from the CEO to say, hey, you're going to have to keep hiring a lot of people, but you're going to have to do it with less money. What am I going to do as a CHRO? What am I going to do as the head of talent acquisition? I got to go invest in technology that's going to help me make me more efficient in filtering resumes, in interviewing candidates, in predicting who's going to sourcing talent. I have to. I can't you know, do it the way I've been doing it. And so as I do that, then I need to figure out, am I compliant? Am I well governed? Am I making sure these technologies are working well? And that's, that's where a company like Fairnow can come in. Well, let's, let's talk about Fairnow. And I'll put, you know, if the AI is the speedy car and laws and regulations are the brakes, where does Fairnow fit in there? Yeah, we're almost, you can imagine the dashboard, right? The diagnostics, the dashboards, we tell you, what's working and what's not. Imagine you're driving a car and you don't have the dashboard. You don't know when you need to refill. You don't know how fast you're going. You don't know if uh, the engine light's on. That's a little scary, right? <laughs> that would be a lot scary. scary. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So imagine where the, uh, the engine, the pipes, where the uh, infrastructure sitting underneath the car, right? Like that's collecting data on various aspects of the, uh, of the workings of the machinery of the car and then telling you, and if, if, if everything's going well, smooth, go for it, right? And if it's not, it's giving you light signals, it's giving you insights, it's telling you how much, why, where you need to fix, get, get it fixed, right? So I think it's actually a very apt analogy. And so that's what we're building, right? We're building a technology that sits under your set of tools. It connects to your HRIS systems. It, 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 it grabs data from there. It's able to um, continuously monitor and see kind of where things are going off the rails, whether it's on a sense of bias or on explainability or effectiveness. Those are the three prongs of our framework. And it's able to then also automate reports for you so you're ready if there is an audit or if there is a compliance requirement that you have to fill, um, it's automated reports, right? And even can build in um, an audit trail for you so that, hey, if you observe something and you went and took action to fix it, 
it can like kind of, you know, build that in as well. So it's really the car analogy is a good one here. And I think it helps you with both automating compliance, but also really giving you the insights around bias, explainability and effectiveness. And let me spend, a, I think bias and explainability, people will understand. If not, I'll, um, you know, ask me and I'll come back and explain it. But I also want to talk about effectiveness, right? As you think about, hey, you know, HR starts bringing in tools, right? For, for hiring, for sourcing, for interviewing, all that kind of stuff. They're spending millions and millions of dollars on these tools. And do they know that they're working? Do they know that? Have they tested them? Have they looked at the data to understand? It's Because here's an example. So there's a well-known phenomenon in um, algorithms of something called model drift, where models over time, can their performance can weaken for a variety of things, you know, reasons I won't get into here, but they can actually start to perform worse over time. It's almost like a battery losing its charge over time, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you did this pilot with this vendor and it looked great, that doesn't mean it's working great a year from now or two years from now or three years from now. So, you you know, you could actually, you know, if our tool allows you to see which tools are working and which ones aren't working well, you could actually save hundreds of thousands of dollars in optimizing your tool uh, basket as well. Right. So I think across the kind of the bias, effectiveness and uh, explainability set, there's a ton of value creation here. I, I could hug you for saying what you just said. It's so important and it needs to be more broadly, not only understood, but respected and decisions made accordingly. Because you're absolutely right, obviously, is that some of the models of yesterday are not appropriate for today. The surrounding dynamics change. Yes. Sometimes the data change. It's That's just, right. it, it, it's right. something that we have to consciously uh, be aware of. Um, I do want to get to the biases and, and, and uh, that theme. However, uh, before we get there, I want to ask you about the laws, not only here in the United States, but in Europe and the value proposition that you and Fairnow bring to understanding those laws over time, uh, because if I am in role as a people analytics leader, or if I'm even on a legal team, to stay up to date on yeah. all that's happening is virtually impossible. I just don't have enough time in the day. Can, exactly. can you, that's part of Fair Now's value proposition, yes? Yeah, yeah, over time, our expectation is we, our, our technology will track and monitor the various laws that are coming into place. So imagine, so this part of it, you know, I like analogies. And so maybe in this context, I'll use the analogy of a turbo tax, right? Which we've all used at various points. You know, I don't know all the tax laws. And if I, if I wanted to go understand all the tax laws, that would take up all my time, right? And so turbo tax knows the laws and knows the laws of the federal taxes, as well as kind of the state and local taxes of where you reside. And so whatever data you input in, it tracks that for you and knows exactly the, the answers to those questions, right? So similarly, we're gonna track the laws. For the jurisdictions that matter to you, they're automatically going to go into effect and going to translate that into what you need to do and what your audit would look like and what your compliance would look like. So absolutely, otherwise, again, HR organizations will have to invest huge amounts of dollars in resources of people to go kind of spend all their time tracking these things. And so that's another part of the value proposition. Well, th you know, again, thank you for, for sharing that. And, and this might be a segue back to, to bias. Mm -hmm. Whose responsibility is it for the AI to be ethical and responsible as is defined? Is it the vendor? Is it the organization that is purchasing, purchasing yeah. the vendor's tool or services? Yeah. Where does the buck stop? Yeah. Um, I think it depends on who is um, uh, the stakeholder, right? And I'm going to define a couple different stakeholders here. Let's start with the most obvious stakeholder. That's the regulator, right? So the regulator is going to define it, right? So in the U.S. at least, again, we're in the early stages of this, right? But from the, con you know, the things I've heard from Keith Sonderling and the EEOC and others, you know, I, I think they're going to hold the users of the technology uh, as responsible. Meaning if you're a company that's using a technology, you don't have plausible deniability. You can't just be like, oh, I didn't know what they were doing. I, you know, uh, you're using the technology, right? And so you need to be well managed on what you're using and how you're using it, right? Now in Europe, you know, I, I've seen a little bit of both. I see in Europe, they're probably, they might be trying to hold both sides accountable, like both the vendor 
and the, the, the company that's using the technology. So I think this is all going to play out still, but mm -hmm. it's clear at a minimum, whether you're in Europe or here, the company, the user is at some level going to be held accountable for sure. Right. So yeah. th that's definitely a thing. Now, that being said, um, you know, and, and the other thing I would add there is also like, imagine you're a, a company using a technology, right? And a bias was discovered. Your associate population is not going to care that that was the vendor's fault. I mean, right? Just think about it, right? Just run that thought experiment to your head. They're going to be upset at you, at the company, that there was bias or that there was something going on or whatever. They don't care if it was X, X technology, Y technology, Z technology. So from the standpoint of like, you know, how you think about these stakeholders, absolutely, you're going to be held responsible for this and you're going to pay the price. Um, now, look, vendors are also going to be have issues. Um, you probably just heard recently about the Workday lawsuit, uh, Al, and that's a pretty big deal. And I've been talking to some customers who are quite worried about that and what how that might kind of trickle down to them. Um, but that Workday lawsuit was specifically about a an individual who was, you know, uh, rejected from, I think, 80 plus jobs he had applied for, where the common denominator of those jobs, at least the claim, is that they were using this Workday filtering technology, right? And so in that case, Again, this is Workday as a vendor being sued, right? So my, my, my view here is like, yeah, both sides need to be very, very careful. And actually, one thing that vendors can do to differentiate themselves is to, you know, use an independent technology or a third party to say, hey, ours is fair. Ours is explainable. Ours is transparent. Ours is effective, right? And that's a way to differentiate yourself. And you've seen this in countless other spaces, right? So you look, for instance, now there's companies like Vanta, SecureFrame, and Drata that will check your SOC 2 compliance. And so they will tell you if you're SOC 2 compliance and they'll give you a, you know, a stamp of approval on that. And so then you can take that and say, hey, look, I'm a vendor, I'm SOC 2 compliant, you'll wanna work with me, right? So this is you know time and time repeated in the past, so nothing different here, but I do think there's an opportunity for vendors to differentiate themselves this way, but ultimately, the companies that use the technologies are going to be the ones I think held accountable. And your value proposition for fair now is primarily to the enterprise or to the vendor or both? To both, to both. Our underlying technology can help both depending on the particular use case and kind of how it all, the data, you know, how the data, you know, sits and all that kind of stuff, but we, we, we can do both. And I, uh, how do I frame this question? Because it's an important one and I'll probably get it a little bit, uh, wrong and it's it, but it's around this theme if uh, if i'm consuming this your product yeah. it's going to invite the question how are they doing all this mm -hmm. <laughs> and so what the if you can uh, maybe give the highlight of you know how but that could be a whole day long discussion i'm yeah. i'm sure but yeah. it almost sounds like miraculous or too good to be true. So if you would just explain as layman's terms, as easy as you can, you know, what is the underlying process by which for you all to do this audit and generate these reports? Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, the, the the important components of this are one, uh, look, we can we, we build the infrastructure and the pipes to connect to your HRIS systems to ingest our data. Now, I will say the quality of our output is as, as good as the quality of your data, right? So if you don't have data or if your data quality isn't high, then that's going to limit the, you know, the value prop here to some degree. But um, again, uh, we all know that, right? Good data in, you get great, great output out, right? Uh, but that's part one, right? Like building the pipes to automatically connect to your systems to make the onboarding process as seamless and as efficient as possible, right? So that's part one. Um, part two is our, our methodology is really to look at the inputs into any process or technology and the outputs. So if you have a tool, let's say, what were the inputs into that tool? What were the outputs of that tool? And based on the input output, we're able to then determine using our models and you know our proprietary technology, was there bias? What, was, what were the explainable factors? And how effective was it, right? The three pillars that I talked about. And so that's where we're able to then give you the insights and say, hey, look, this tool is working or not working in this part of that dashboard, right? And then knowing, and then our, the other part of our technology, which we talked about is we know the, the, the laws, so to speak, right? And knowing the laws, we can check the output or whatever the, the metrics are against the laws and say, hey, are you in compliance there? And then be able to produce the report automatically, right? So those are kind of the features and aspects of it. 
The last piece I'll say is we can also do this in a way where we can bring your data onto our cloud and be able and analyze things there. Or if that feels too risky, we can do it on your cloud and never see your data, right? The only thing that sees your data is our algorithms, but we wouldn't see your data or whatever. And we can analyze everything where your data sits. So we can do it either way. The advantage of the data coming over is you might get some additional insights like benchmarking insights and stuff like that. But if you're more worried about security and you want to keep, you don't want to share your data, we can still analyze, uh, still do the analysis. My friend, you are a fantastic storyteller. I understand it way better now than I did two minutes ago. So thank you for that. Yeah. And you, we probably have 10 minutes, maybe a little bit more um, left. So I want to take us to the future now because we're agreed that we're moving fast. And obviously we're in this age of what I call perpetual disruption and both technologically, obviously what's happening in Europe and there's tension you know, around the world. So what do you hope is going to emerge not only with AI, but frankly with your company and its role in promoting the ethical and responsible use of AI? I, look, I think um, the next decade is just going to be fascinating on the impact. I think there's two transformative technologies in the next decade. Uh, one is climate tech and the other is AI. And I think these two things are just, just big, big deals, right? Mm -hmm. um, and again, for AI to be a big deal, there has to be trust in this system, right? Mm -hmm. And hopefully Fair Now can play a small part or a big part, I don't know, of, of building that trust in that system, right? Imagine a tool that can allow companies to feel like they know what's going on with their AI tools. They can fix things when they need to. Employees feel trust that, hey, their company cares about this topic, is looking into it, is compliant. And vendors are have trust because they're you know in compliance and they know that their uh, tools are fair. And, and there's just trust all around, right? Then imagine the potential for what this technology can, can do and can be where it can be adopted and how it can perform. And, and imagine a world where there's no trust. Mm -hmm. Imagine a world where there's no trust. There's constant lawsuits. There's constant litigation. There's constant kind of um, uh, technologists fighting with ludites, fighting with regulators, fighting with uh, workers, fighting with management. Like just imagine, right? And so the friction and the and and and, and how much it would slow 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 things down. And so I think again, trust is like the catalyst for doing things well and, and going fast, both, right? You don't, I, I don't see it as a friction. I think lack of trust is the friction. Trust enables speed and enables us to all move faster. And I think that's what we, at Fair Now, that's our mission to be part of that uh, ecosystem and building that trust. And so I think that's, that, that's where the future is. Um, I, I think it's up to us to, to build trust, each one of us to, to help build the trust in this future that we think is coming our way. Um, and to take care of each other along the way. And I, since I know the answer here, but I would surmise that you advocate that leaders be proactive in this regard and not reactionary. Because if they're reactionary, obviously they're going to be behind the eight ball already and trust will have been eroded, if not compromised altogether. Is that a fair statement? I think it's important to be proactive. And, and there's two reasons for this. Uh, I want to hit on one of them. And then your second point uh, I want to address as well. I think the progress in AI has the potential to be exponential. Oh. And exponential progress or exponential change is something human minds, again, this is my, you know, the human psychology side of me that's, uh, that, that's coming out on this. But like humans have a hard time understanding exponential change. We understand linear change right? Okay. Five years ago, it looked like this. Okay. Five years from now, it's going to look about the same difference, right? That's linear change, right? Exponential change is what happened during COVID. So I just want to take us all back to 2020, right? Why was it so discombobulating? It was so discombobulating because the minute you thought you understood it and you had your hands around it, it changed again. Right. Remember that spring and summer. And I, you know, I was part of conversations at Capital One, but I know every company and every leader was trying to figure out, hey, how, how do I deal with this? What's the what's the policy I want to set? 
What's the health policy, the work policy? Are we working from home? Are we working here? When are we coming back? What, you know, are we asking for this vaccine? Or th There were just so many questions. And the minute they got to a decision point, things on the ground had already changed. And so if you're not being proactive, you're going to be running after the eight ball every single week, every single year. And so I asked leaders who went through COVID and who experienced be, being behind the eight ball constantly, how did that feel? How did that feel for making decisions? How did that feel for your own sense of comfort and security and being well managed? How did that feel for empowering your workforce? How did that feel for running your business? And it's going to be very similar here, right? We all saw chat GPT in November of 20, well, I think it was in November of 2022. Um, impressive. Fallible and impressive. Chat, the next version of chat GPT, it's not going to be a little better, Al. It's going to be way better, right? And it's also going to be way concerning, right? And so all of this stuff is going to pro progress exponentially. And if you're like, well, let me wait and see what everyone else is doing, or let me wait a year, things are going to change a lot in a year. Yeah. No, oh, go ahead. No, no. That, that, that was my point. That was yeah, my point. Your, your point is super well taken. And not only is it going to change a lot, the adoption thereof is astounding because uh, it's not it, it, people is a consumer product as it stands right now. And this is going to go into organizations in one form or another. And I would posit that it's going to be similarly adopted. You know, right. In other words, people are yeah. going to jump in. Yeah. And yeah. so how is that going to, to be, I don't want to say controlled, controlled, but how is it going to, are, how are ethical and responsible actions going to be maintained? And that is going to require some knowledge about what the heck is going on. So, and that's what I hear you bringing to the fore. It's like, okay, I have that dashboard. I have those insights. So I have a heightened level of confidence that I am promoting a good, healthy environment for my workers and I'm not perpetuating or exacerbating bias. Is that you know something that you're driving towards? It's like, hey, if this doesn't happen, you're just going to hope that something else comes in and fits in and you see an opportunity. So you're feeling it. Is that what's happening? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I look, I think we are going to play an important part in this in this ecosystem. Right. And so, look, our technology can do a lot, but I think it will also require HR to take more seriously this this notion of governance around um, its processes and its tools. Right. Just like the business has been investing in this over the years slowly, right? Again, you're seeing more and more companies starting to incorporate AI in other parts of their businesses and their functions and just starting to put rules in place or governance in place. And I think this is actually going to be a pretty big job category in the future, Al. The notion of AI governance, it's going to be a job category, I think, just like risk and compliance is a job category today or Data analytics is a job category today. I think AI governance, AI risk management is going to be a job category in the future. And there's going to, there are going to be leaders of that within companies. Um, but in the meantime, I think each function is going to be responsible, right? Because at the end of the day, if HR you know gets sued on something, it's the CHRO who's responsible for that today, right? So right. I, I think CHRO, you know, they will have to build some capabilities internally and understanding of these things in conjunction with you know platforms like ours to help mitigate some of that risk for them. All right. Well, fantastic. Well, as we start to wrap up, I'm you ready for a few uh, rapid fire questions and then I'll give you an opportunity to wrap things up. Does that sound good? All right. Now I'm excited to hear what these are. All right. Here, here we go. Uh, what's your favorite genre of music? Oh, man. Uh, look, I grew up in the uh, in the 90s, right? Like, um, so... <laughs> Uh, I, I would say, you know, alternative music that I listen to is still in, and, you know, classic, you know, old rock and like uh, alternative music and grunge and, alter, you know, that's still, it, it just, you know, they say like music is the thing that like kind of um, sets off your memory most. Music and smell, it's interesting, right? Like our, uh, those things like really remind you of stuff. And so that music still reminds me of growing up and being a teenager and growing up in the 90s. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we, we share that affinity. So just, <laughs> I lo love it. Um, what do you do for fun? Uh, a couple of things. Um, I love being outdoors. Um, I, I think I shared this with you 
uh, when we were just catching up again recently. Uh, during COVID, my family and I lived out in the Mountain West for three different times, adding up to almost like six months. Uh, we spent time in in Arizona, in Boulder, Colorado, in Bozeman, Montana, and just got beautiful. Our Mountain West is just a, such a treasure, Al. Um, I know you love being outdoors as well. And, um, you know, hopefully maybe someday I'll retire out there, but love being outdoors. I'm a huge sportsman. I played sports growing up. I um, was a competitive tennis player and I love playing sports and uh, love still getting out there to play tennis and golf and uh, and then spending time with my my family. Uh, with, you know, it's uh, I, I love I love spending time with them. I love my two little girls and love hanging out with them. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, who inspires you, whether it be currently or you know, over the past you know, several years or like someone that maybe we recognize or maybe not? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to give a specific name, but I'll give you archetypes because there's many people who inspire me, but that fall under this archetype. Mm -hmm. And it's really um, the thing that I think I, is often missing these days, which is, um, you know, humility. Um, I, I think in this world, I don't know if it's social media, I don't know if it's technology, but everyone thinks they have the right answer. They know the right answer. Everyone is kind of selling themselves or marketing themselves. Um, and it, it's almost like the art of just being quiet and doing your job and being humble and, and learning. And, uh, I, I, you know, when you make mistakes, learning from it and acknowledging your mistakes and whatnot, like all of that just seems to be like a lost art. And so when I come across people who are just humble, right, just absolutely mm -hmm. humble, and they might be successful, um, but they're just humble, that inspires me every day. Cause that's, that's, that's the kind of person I want to be. And I aspire to be. Well, I, I, I love it. And again, I share that too, because it's just such a gravitational force, yes. uh, hu That's humility, right. and That's it's right. just it's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, last question, uh, to young people, mm -hmm. like early career professionals, those maybe still in, in university or maybe even high school, mm -hmm. what is your hope for them? A couple of things. One, one I'll say is... Um, enjoy your career, like enjoy it, right? Like, you know, so many times I hear people that like just have gotten promoted or they're have just taken on a new job and it's already like, what's next, right? Like what, how am I angling for the next thing? Or how am I angling for the next promotion? Enjoy your career, right? Like it's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be, you know, if you, the closest you can make it to a hobby or to a craft or like something you would deeply enjoy, that's the biggest thing I'll, I'll uh, advice I can give them. Like, um, you know, look, you're, you're gonna, you know, one thing I've learned, Al, and, you know, tell me if you agree with this, uh, you know, I've always been a very kind of competitive, uh, achievement oriented person, and I'm really happy with my career in so many ways, but I learned early on, you know, when I got that promotion or when I got more money or when I got the accolade, I'd be happy for about a day for if I was lucky, maybe a week. And then it's gone. The world moves on and you, even you move on and it's done. And you're like, man, all that effort. And so if you're, if you're expecting like promotions and accolades and all these things to drive your happiness, it's not, it's just not. And so figure out what it is that makes you happy and, and enjoy your career. Be, enjoy it. Enjoy the moments, enjoy the day to day and, and, and just really enjoy your, your time as a, as a working adult. I uh, absolutely love it. And for what it's worth, yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. And that's what I hope for my kids. And that's what I hope for those that I'm privileged to advise or coach. And it's uh, it's something that as we move into this age, again, a perpetual disruption of AI, of globalization, it, it's a different world than mm -hmm. when we grew up. Mm -hmm. And I want them to stay in this compassionate curiosity and creativity and because you know, it's not fixed, you know, it's a, it's a different that's, that's right. age, yeah. you know. So, yeah, there's huge opportunity and I hope they enjoy it as I do. Well, mm -hmm. Guru, it's freaking awesome to yeah. talk with you, to hear what you have to say about ethical AI, about fair now, about doing people data for good and, and bringing that to life. So as we... Uh, again, wrap closing comments and how can people learn more about you and fair now? Yeah, very quickly. I mean, two main things, uh, um, my LinkedIn, um, uh, you can find me there and I'll be posting, uh, blogs on this topic. I'll be writing on this topic and, and so on and so forth. So you definitely can follow me there. And then our website is fairnow.ai. Um, so come there, learn about more about what we're building. Um, you'll see also some of my writings there. You can learn more about kind of 
where regulation is headed, where AI is headed, and hopefully find solutions for some of these challenges and we can help you. All right. Well, Guru, thank you yet again. You be well and uh, look forward to seeing you in person uh, soon. Absolutely, Al. It was a pleasure as always. You ask great questions and really enjoy the conversation. All right. Thank you much. Appreciate you. All right. Be well. Thank you for listening to the People Analytics and Future of Work podcast with me, Al Adamson. To learn and be inspired by other great thought leaders and influencers, please visit pafau.net. There you can learn how to support the ongoing creation of this type of content. You can also learn more about our sponsors who help underwrite this. And finally, you can learn about learning experiences where you can co-create and collaborate with peers around the world, those who share similar interests or diverse opinions. So thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting the People Data for Good movement. And please continue to make great things happen.